Dr. Jagadish gave a nice approach to the liver diseases in an infant. So I try to take on from here about the liver diseases in an older child. So this would be the roadmap for my lecture. Uh, I would be dealing with common liver diseases among older children. If you get an older child, what would you think of as differential diagnosis, clinical features, how to use investigations and their interpretation, management, and towards the latter part, actually, the crust of the matter would be concentrating more on autoimmune liver diseases and Wilson disease. If you look at this picture, actually, you can see you can see a range of children who have got liver diseases ranging from infancy to an older child. So the differential diagnosis when you see this kind of a child are different from one child to the other. It mainly depends on their age as well. So let's look at what are they. Before going to that actually, I really want you to think in this way if that is possible. If you get a child who's suspected to have liver disease, if it is possible for you to think of two aspects about the liver diagnosis. For example, if you have a five-year-old child coming with jaundice and you suspect liver disease, provided you have excluded hemolysis. So you ask two questions. What is the hepatic phenotype of this child? If it is a liver disease and what's the underlying etiology? What do I mean by hepatic phenotype? So any child with jaundice can have acute hepatitis, could have acute liver failure, compensated chronic liver disease, or it may be decompensated, or it may be acute on chronic liver failure. So this is the hepatic phenotype. This gives you how much you have to panic about this diagnosis. For example, if it is acute liver failure, yes, you have to rush and discuss with the transplant team. But if it is just self-limiting acute hepatitis or a less degree of damage which is shown, then you can just relax a bit and investigate further. So it's very important you look at the hepatic phenotype throughout the clinical course. The second question I would like to think of is the etiology. For example, a child with acute hepatitis that may be due to autoimmune liver disease, may be due to Wilson disease, may be due to dengue hepatitis. Again, if it is acute liver failure, the same scenario. It could be due to Wilson disease or autoimmune liver disease or maybe seronegative hepatitis. So for a given hepatic phenotype, again, there are multiple possibilities as the etiology. So Dr. Jagadish clearly mentioned what are the possible etiologies with their explanations in an infant and a younger child. So let's see what are the common possible reasons in an older child when you suspect a liver disease, irrespective of their hepatic phenotype. So I've put the infectious hepatitis at the top, but just to mention a word about it, Earlier era, maybe 10 years ago, uh, the clinicians used to see a lot of viral hepatitis, especially hepatitis A. But nowadays, with the improvement of the sanitation and the lifestyle, it has much become less. So we hardly see these cases, though we still see. Among infectious hepatitis, yes, in our part of the world, dengue hepatitis is common, but usually it doesn't cause much trouble unless in very selected cases. However, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It does not really come to the attention of the pediatrician or maybe a liver specialist. However, a lot of cases of non-alcoholic fatty liver diseases are scattered in the community. And most of these children are not really recognized as having liver disease. So that's an important etiology in the current era among older children. Next come to autoimmune liver disease and Wilson disease, two important diseases which are treatable among the older crowd. I would say I would be very much concentrating on diagnosing these two because we do have specific, specific medical therapy to treat autoimmune liver disease and Wilson disease. And early initiation of therapy might prevent going ahead with transplantation, which is very, very lucky thing to have. Next, metabolic and genetic liver diseases. You would ask me, yes, Wilson disease is again a metabolic or a genetic disease. Yes, that is true. However, to give the due importance, I will put that as a different category and because it's quite common as well. Metabolic and genetic liver diseases otherwise would include tyrosinemia, progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis, allergyl syndrome, even among the adult childhood. We had a child with uh, tyrosinemia, I could remember, who was first diagnosed at the age of nine years. So you really have to consider them as well when you see, a, see an older child with liver disease. 
drug-induced liver disease. Again, we should not forget about drug-induced liver disease, especially when you don't have a clear-cut etiology. Because sometimes parents might not reveal you that the child is on antidepressant medications or anti-TB medications due to stigma, or they might have used Ayurvedic medications for some reason, which they might not reveal. So they might not sometimes think it's important to tell. So it's very important, especially if your ALT is more than ASD, think about drug-induced liver disease. Because the treatment is very simple. You stop the drug and the patient is expected to improve in most of the cases. So just to recap the clinical features, we all are aware about these clinical features. The standard textbook would describe. The examination findings, it's easy if you go by system-wise. The general examination, the important things you would look at, and our routine abdominal examination would include all these things. And CNS-wise, it's very important that you look at the features of encephalopathy. And it's very important you intervene them before they develop encephalopathy. In addition to that, a child with liver disease might have neurovision features as well. Respiratory wise, in regards to liver disease, if they are encephalopathic, they might have features of aspiration or concomitant lower respiratory tract infection. Cardiovascular wise, it's just the vital parameters and blood pressure. Let's look at the role of investigations. When you have an older child suspected to have liver disease, we would say we have an 80 year old boy who's referred with jaundice for two weeks and you want to commence on investigations. So we all would do these basic investigations to begin with. The full blood count would help you to look at the hemoglobin. They might have concomitant hemolysis in Wilson and platelet count, which might indicate portal hypertension and secondary thrombocytopenia and so many other important reasons for you to narrow down your differential diagnosis. Liver profile again will be helpful and I'll look at that in detail in the next slide. Renal function sometimes, especially blood gases when you have a case of Wilson disease or tyrosinemia. Clotting is important because that's the synthetic function. Alpha fetoprotein, how would that be helpful? It is mainly helpful in older children because of tyrosinemia, because in tyrosinemia, alpha fetoprotein is expected to be high. Apart from that, especially in PFIC type 2, if they have developed secondary hepatomas, again, alpha fetoprotein will be high. Vitamin levels are important for management and standard imaging with ultrasound scan and triple phase CT. We have extensively discussed about endoscopy and other modalities of imaging would be fibro scan or transient elastography. Liver biopsy again, very useful. Certain diagnoses actually we totally rely on liver parts. For example, autoimmune liver disease, we cannot diagnose without a liver histology. It's the gold standard for diagnosis. Post-transplant rejection, it's the gold standard for diagnosis. So you can't replace histology in those conditions by any other investigation. Echo and bubble echo would be useful if you suspect hepatopulmonary syndrome and if facilities are available, ammonia will give you some idea about detoxifying function of the liver. Just to look at the liver profile in a little bit detail, your transaminases will give you some idea about the degree of hepatitis going on. But having said that, in end-stage liver disease, you might have normal transaminases because they do not have liver cells remaining. But in infectious hepatitis, ischemia, autoimmune hepatitis, you will get higher transaminases. Gamma GT is raised in most of the cholesterol disorders. However, in PFIC 1, 2, and 4, as you heard, it will be normal or low. Alkaline phosphatase is less useful, I would say, because in a growing child, it will be anyway high. Albumin and clotin, very important, because these are two specific questions if I ask when I get a referral, because it indicates your liver synthetic function. Bilirubin is raised in most of the cholesterol liver diseases. However, if you carefully look at the direct and indirect bilirubin, you have a significantly high indirect bilirubin as well. In addition to direct bilirubin in an older child, think about hemolysis related to Wilson disease. Just to recap about imaging. Imaging does have a big role to play. The simple ultrasound scan will give you a lot of idea about the liver status, clinomically, the signs of portal hypertension, especially the focal nodules in the liver. It's very helpful. And if you want to assess further the cross-sectional imaging, the CT scan would be helpful as well. 
liver biopsy it's a very important test however in certain diagnosis in the current era it has been replaced by genetics for example if you have a child suspected to have wilson disease you might go ahead with genetics and you might not really do biopsy because there is no additional advantage of doing biopsy which is an invasive procedure which carries risk when you have the chance to diagnose it genetically similarly for a gsd you might not do a liver biopsy having said that as i mentioned in autoimmune liver disease rejection and certain conditions liver biopsies must earlier i can remember when i was a house officer we used to do liver biopsies at the bedside in the pediatric ward so now the technology has advanced so much which we really need to adapt the liver biopsy has been safely handed over to the interventional radiologist or a radiologist to perform under ultrasound scan guidance whenever possible because the procedure is with lot of risks it carries lot of risks we should not just do it at the bedside in the pediatric ward if there is a radiologist who is willing to do it under radiological guidance so that is something we should change in our practice so this is just to give you an idea about the specific investigation because we, so far we just mentioned about the general investigations and how would they be useful in a child with liver disease so, so what are the specific investigations which would help us to narrow down our differential diagnosis so this just to give you a brief idea and an outline about the specific diseases and the specific investigations you might think of carrying out So this is the last part of the first part of the talk, which would encompass the general idea about the liver diseases in an older child. So management of a child with liver disease. Most of the time, or oh, some of the time, we are not sure about the diagnosis. We have a child or an older child with, who's suspected to have liver disease. So though we do not know the underlying diagnosis, it may be just a virus, which might be self-limiting, it may be autoimmune liver disease where you are waiting to do the biopsy, but meanwhile, there are certain things that we can do, even we do not have a specific diagnosis. So general management wise, ursolytic folic acid would enhance the biliary drainage and will try and reduce the cholestasis and further damage to the liver. And fat soluble vitamins, prophylaxis with portal hypertension, albumin infusions, if there is edema with significantly low albumin, diuretics whenever indicated are useful and in addition to that especially the enteral antibodies when you have a child with acute liver failure like rifaximin and antipleuritic medications especially in pfic when you have significant cholestasis and itching which impairs the quality of life of the child as well as the family up to a greater extent the antipleuritic medications are very helpful you might be just waiting for the genetics confirmation However, that would not preclude you treating the child's pruritus. That would improve the quality of life. Nutrition. I would say nutrition is considered as a medication for the liver recovery. It's very important while you progress with your investigations and the diagnostics, you start on nutritional rehabilitation. And whenever appropriate cholangitis prophylaxis and endoscopy for all children with portal hypertension. On the other side, you can appreciate the specific management for common etiologies. If you suspect a treatable uh, viral cause like hepatitis B or C, then you could think of antivirals, the weight reduction in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, simply the cessation of the drug in drug-induced liver injury. NAC is helpful if it's paracetamol overdose and steroids for autoimmune liver disease, copper chelators for Wilson disease, and it is known for tyrosinemia. Ultimately, if you are not able to salvage the liver or the liver damage is so much it's not recovering with medical management and supportive care, you have this beautiful treatment at the end as the ultimate cure, which is liver transplantation, which can just give a new life to a child who is simply dying. So we have dedicated our symposium, the latter part, afternoon sessions, totally for the liver transplantation. So I'm not going into details about this topic. Now I'm approaching the second part of my lecture, which would include more facts about autoimmune liver disease and Wilson's. Let me just justify why I do like this, because if you take the children who have been referred to a liver unit at old age group, 
among the treatable courses, among the courses which are not self, which would not go into self-resolution, the two most common diseases would be autoimmune liver disease and Wilson disease. And also these two diseases would go into or would result in so much confusion, they are often it's misdiagnosed one or the other. So I think it's important for us to know that in detail. Autoimmune liver disease, it's by definition an inflammatory disorder, which is characterized by raised transaminases. Always your transaminases would be significantly raised. And raised immunoglobulins, positive autoantibodies, and key features on liver histology with or without bile duct dilatation on cholangiogram. So these key features would tell you you are having a child with, you are dealing with a child who has got autoimmune liver disease. So these are the specific questions you need to ask. The other important actually to stress on disease, this is the treatable disease. So this is the broad classification of autoimmune liver diseases. There are three main categories. It could be autoimmune hepatitis, autoimmune sclerosing cholangitis, or sometimes you can have a bit of a both with over the overlap syndrome, and de novo autoimmune hepatitis following liver transplant. What does that mean? If you transplant a child for autoimmune liver disease, they can have the recurrence of the disease. However, that doesn't, that would not be a contraindication, but in unfortunate cases, you can have a recurrence. So autoimmune hepatitis could be type 1 or 2. So diagnostics wise, there is no single objective test. Unfortunately, if there is a genetic mutation, it would have been quite easier, but there is no single objective test. So these are the main characteristics you would look at. The liver profile would be abnormal 100% of the time. Raised immunoglobulin will be there in 90% of the time. Positive autoantibodies 75% of the time and suggestive liver histology 100% of the time. So in good hands of histopathologists, it's very reliable to establish a diagnosis based on histology on autoimmune liver disease. But yes, of course, you need to have an experienced liver histopathologist. And we should try and exclude all the other causes and competitive differential diagnosis, especially the Wilson disease in this age category. Because if we are really doubtful, we can perform genetics and exclude Wilson disease and have more confidence in diagnosing autoimmune liver disease. Sometimes it may be misleading because raised immunoglobulin could be there in any other diseases of uh, chronic liver diseases as well. I'll give you an example. We had a nine-year-old girl who had raised immunoglobulin, who had chronic liver disease, but there were no other features to suggest autoimmune liver disease. So there was huge discussion and dilemma whether this is autoimmune liver disease. However, more features were towards Wilson, so we performed genetics and she was found to have Wilson disease despite having high immunoglobulin. So the reason is when you have chronic liver disease, they can get polygamma globulinemia, so in isolation, just high immunoglobulin would not be satisfactory or good enough to diagnose autoimmune liver disease. You can have that in other liver diseases as well. So to always try and get all these features together when you make a diagnosis of autoimmune liver disease and try and try your best to exclude other competitive differential diagnosis. And some people do have this idea, the relationship of AST, ALT, AST more than ALT or ALT more than AST. It is usually ALT more than ESD, but not 100%. So you can't really go by that. And again, the ANA positivity. If somebody has ANA positive, would that be good enough to say autoimmune hepatitis? Possibly not, because 7% of the normal population, you can have ANA positive. So just only ANA positive in the absence of other features like this would not really conclude as autoimmune hepatitis. So this is just to elaborate on the antibody profile. You can see in type 1, you can have ANA and anti-smooth muscle antibody positivity. And type 2, you can have anti-liver kidney microsomal antibody positivity most all, all the time. Image invites, yes, ultrasound scan would show biliary dilatations and MRCT is helpful in sclerosis and cholangitis. Again, that would show you bleeding in the biliary system. ERCP is technically difficult in children at younger age. So therapeutic goals wise, what are your aims? If you uh, try and treat a child with autoimmune liver disease, you won't know symptoms. If they have jaundice and all, you would try and aim for no symptoms. 
And you need biochemical remission as well. Normal liver uh, transaminase, as I would say, with normal IgG. So you would follow them up with liver enzymes and immunoglobulins as well as to achieve negativity for autoantibodies. And finally, the gold standard of achievement would be the histological remission, the normal liver histology. And you are trying to achieve these therapeutic goals with minimum uh, drug-related adverse effects because the drugs you use are immunosuppressive agents, which would be toxic. So these are the immunosuppressive medications, which could be steroids or azathioprine as main uh, stay of treatment. And you have other medications as well, like MMA, tacrolimus, and cyclosporine in difficult cases. Other medications would include your supportive care and oral vancomycin has, has shown some benefit in IBD-associated autoimmune sclerosis cholangitis. So the follow-up wise, autoimmune hepatitis type 2 unfortunately would require lifelong therapy and type 1. Usually you can consider taking off or weaning off immunosuppression if they have achieved and remained in remission for three years. Uh, sclerosing cholangitis, possibly lifelong treatment, and there's a higher chance of recurrence after transplant. So that's all about autoimmune liver disease, which is an important disease to know among old childhood. So lastly, I'm moving to Wilson disease. It's again the important competitive differential diagnosis. Uh, by this time, we all know it's an inherited disorder in autosomal recessive manner, and the mutations would lie in ATP7BG. And it can affect multiple organs in the body, predominantly liver and the brain, and it can affect eyes, kidneys, and uh, red cells as well. The diagnosis is usually facilitated by Wilson's diagnostic score, which I will discuss, but better confirmed with genetic testing. Copper chelators are the mainstay. However, sometimes you would need liver transplantation as well. The reported outcomes are very much satisfactory if you treat them appropriately. How would they present with liver disease? So they can have a diverse uh, presentation modes like race transaminases, which may be incidentally found, or just overt acute liver failure or acute or chronic liver failure. So there's a range of presentations a virus and disease can appear. And the key message is any child who's more than one year with undiagnosed liver disease should be investigated for Wilson disease. So these are about the other manifestations, other systemic manifestations. So what are the key diagnostic methods? Cellulotasmin is usually a reliable mode of biochemistry. The normal range is 20 to 40, and it's usually significantly low in affected children. Serum copper is not very helpful because it could be low, normal, low, high. 24-hour urinary copper, the baseline pre-penicillamine and post-penicillamine test is supportive, especially in symptomatic children. However, if you have a genetic diagnosis, that will give you so much confidence to predict on their genotype, phenotype, as well as to treat them as Wilson disease. So this is the gold standard always you should try and aim. So again, the, another test is liver copper. Histology, I'm not going into detail because Dr. Mukul has given a nice idea about histology in Wilson disease. But liver copper can be done in certain countries. In UK, they get the dry copper from the liver biopsy. And then you can have a, a value of more than 250, which would be highly suggestive of Wilson disease. But it's very costly, so we cannot do that here. Maybe it's beneficial to do genetic instead of that. I'm sorry about the imaging. Something has happened with the online, but we'll move on. So the brain imaging is very important. Uh, MRI imaging, where you would see the uh, changes in the basal ganglia, the typical signs of Wilson disease, uh, which would be very helpful for you to follow up as well. You have documented the brain effect, uh, brain involvement and start chelators, and then you would see the improvements as well. Wilson's diagnostic score, you can see that a lot of features like clinical features, laboratory markers, and the genetics and the histological findings all are incorporated in this diagnostic score. However, if you have a score of four or more, it says more or highly likely, but the confirmation would be with genetics. Medication spice, the standard treatment would be the copper chelators, the penicillamine, or in resistant cases, or if the patient exhibits side effects for penicillamine, you will go for trientine. Otherwise, penicillamine is very effective and zinc can be used additionally as well. 
If you have an asymptomatic and normal LFTs, you can start only with seeing, but if the child is symptomatic, always go for chelators. So you can take a screenshot about the drugs and drug doses from this slide, and we can share it later as well. So liver transplantation for Wilson disease. Wilson disease is a very clear-cut indication for liver transplantation for all the hepatic phenotype. However, neuro Wilson's disease. If you have advanced neuro Wilson's disease, you might have an MDT meeting before you list the child for transplantation because if you have reversible significant neurological disease, you might not consider the child for liver transplantation. Otherwise, if you have clear-cut hepatic phenotype with minimal or no neurological features, yes, it's a straightforward indication for liver transplantation. kings Wilson Index. Actually, this has made our life quite easier. You can use this index for children with Wilson disease or suspected of Wilson disease. If you think about transplant, you might ask the question, does this child really require transplant? Because this is a disease which can be treatable with medicine. So if you calculate this score, this would give you some idea whether the transplant is indicated at this point. If the score is 11 or more, it would say yes. Without transplant, there'll be high mortality. You better plan a transplant. So this is the same thing I mentioned, the neurology and liver transplant. Um, in addition to what I mentioned, only for neurovirusins, the place of liver transplantation is doubtful with the evidence we have at present. Various evidences are coming from across the world about neurovirusins and liver transplantation. However, at present, for overt neurological disease alone, without much uh, significant cirrhosis, uh, we would not really recommend liver transplant. Family screening is part and parcel of the management of Wilson disease. You really need to screen the other children. I'm sure you gathered that message from Dr. Padma Pani's lecture. If you have an index case, please do screen the siblings and start them on treatment if they are diagnosed. Because early treatment will prevent liver damage. So that brings me to the end of my lecture. So the key features I would like to highlight are the differential diagnosis for liver diseases in an older child are different from an infant and a younger child. The self-limiting viral hepatitis is less common, but nowadays in a liver community, autoimmune liver disease and Wilson disease are quite common and they are treatable. So it's very important that you look at them. Thank you so much for your patient listening.